But yeah, I'm going to be talking about the sucking insects on cotton, which is about all we've got left. Uh, Chris back there and the rest of us, you don't have, have to eradicate the boll weevil, so we got rid of that major pest and could do some different things. And, and uh, some of the BT technology came to our salvation at about that time. We, we, just, we were about out of business controlling budworms, but uh, uh, now we're two proteins in, in the BT cotton. So basically we're taking care of all the caterpillar pests, except maybe cutworms, you can have some problems. But, but really that just leaves the sucking insect. So we're not uh, dealing with, with what we did uh, 15 years ago. I'm going to do the sucking insects. I'm going to do them as they come in the season. Most of these are real small, come in huge numbers. So from a scouting perspective, they're not a problem to, to know that you've got them. It's just a problem knowing when to do something about them, if and what, and, and that sort of thing. I'll go through the life histories as we will with the other insects and, and that sort of thing going through these. The last one I'll talk about is the tarnished plant bugs. Quite a bit different. Uh, bigger insect, moves around a lot, hard to scout for, does need to be scouted for. Uh, and that sort of thing. I'll start with thrips. Uh, they're a unique order of insects. Uh, one of my trick questions is, what is the number one cotton insect pest uh, in Alabama? But it's a trick question because the farmers know they have thrips in every field every year, so they do something about it. One of the few insects that we do uh, preventative things for. So, uh, used to we put a granular insecticide down in the furrow. Timic was the number one product. We had others. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We've, we've gone to the seed treatments, which contain a neonicotinoid insecticide, uh, and they provide about three weeks of thrips control from the day of planting, not the day of emergence, from the day uh, of planting. Not so much here, although to some extent we had complaints about those products up here, but down south there were a lot of complaints. It was not that the products weren't working, there was just a huge migration of thrips into cotton. You know, these things have to feed uh, before they die. Uh, so, you know, they were, they were killing what was coming in the field, but you just you kept, kept getting more and more insects out there. Same with the foliar application. I get in on complaint calls. Uh, you know, the product worked just fine, but we got a new batch of thrips coming in three, three days later. Uh, and then all of that was magnified this year by the slow, the poor, poor growing conditions and the slow growth of cotton, which if it's not growing, you're going to get a lot of that. But back to the thrips, we have multiple species in cotton. 32nd of an inch long, you can see these on your hand, a white sheet of paper or something like that, but that's about it. See the wings, which are kind of unique, uh, you would, it would take, take magnification. We may have a tobacco thrips, which is a dark, dark species. That's the one we start out with, uh, and then it'll, it'll evolve into a migration. This thing doesn't seem to go backwards. Into that yellow species, which is most normally the flower thrips. Uh, both are pretty easy to kill. There's another yellow species, the western flower thrips, that is receiving a lot of attention in the press and a lot of talk on the turn rows and that sort of thing. It's a fairly rare occurrence, uh, even up here, uh, except during extreme drought years. And the reason we talk about it, it's a little bit more difficult to control, actually a whole lot more difficult to control uh, than are the other two species. We also have a soybean thrips, which is sort of gray and white banded. Used to be very common up here. Uh, we still see it, but not as common as, as we once did. Some old plot work from here on the station. Uh, you know, good thrips control versus bad. That's what you get into. That's why we put out a, a preventative application. Thrips, especially the immatures, will get in the bud of the plant and feed around there. There, don't forget we're talking about sucking insects. They didn't chew the edges off this leaf, but that is thrips damage, but it was done in the bud of the plant, and then as those leaves came out, they were deformed. Uh, but that much damage was done from by a piercing, sucking insect down there. Uh, you know, it almost uh, looked like sandblasting injury and all, all sorts of things. But if this plant is not growing rapidly, uh, the thrips can really wear it out. There. So the quicker you grow, you get a little dilution of the damage, and uh, uh, it, it helps everything. But this sort of, that's a fairly old plant, that's cotyledon and true leaves. Uh, you know, that, that's a four true leaf plant, you know, that, that needed control about three leaves ago. Here's a plant, uh, maybe a little older, but not a whole lot older. It looks ragged up pretty good. I don't care, that's history as far as I'm concerned. In making thrips control decisions, 
I'm looking right here. The new leaves coming out are slick, green, and pretty. I'm not worried about it. I concentrate on the terminal of the plant, that little rolled up or furled leaf. If it's uh, scorched black on the tip or if it's rounded off and you can knock thrips off in your hands, you've probably got a problem. Otherwise, you don't. We get the biggest bang for our bucks when we control thrips on a one to two true leaf plant. Uh, try to time your applications early. That's when you're going to uh, get something for your money. Uh, it's also less likely to flare other insects. We're mainly talking about uh, mites and aphids now. But they're easily flared, and if we don't need to go with, with thrips control, we probably should not. Uh, but you know, I freely admit that's a tough decision. It is real hard to go out there, but I know we're trying to time with herbicide applications and, and all sorts of things. Uh, I did take a few calls yesterday on, on herbicide insecticide interactions and enhanced phytotoxicity with that. That's another reason not spray when you don't need to. If you leave that insecticide out of the mix, you know, you're that, that much better off because there is not a good answer. You can enhance injury with all the products, some less than others, but uh, they, they do in, in, enhance your risk of injury. Just, you know, a, a plant that usually we say if you get to three, three to four true leaf stage, you know, cotton will outgrow anything that thrips can do to it. Uh, last year, if y'all recall, those, the flower thrips, we just had an intense and long migration. We were spraying cotton this old last year and needed to. It was very exceptional, exceptional year. I would probably treat this cotton, but uh, it should have been treated weeks, weeks before. Any questions on thrips before I move on? The neonicotinoids, they, you know, they're different than Demic. They, they, they are, are shorter residual. They do not provide any spider mite control. Uh, there are, there are other, other differences, but when they came out, they were a pleasant surprise to myself and other researchers working with those compounds. We put them in the field. Uh, we looked at the plots and, and the plants were, they were ragged up pretty good, especially if a Timic plot was, was right next, next door, Grady. And we said, I don't know about these things. And, 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 and we were getting some numbers too. But we got to the fall, and me and every other counterpart I got, they yielded fine. Uh, and I think that's what, what we're being told there is it's critical uh, to control thrips early. That three weeks of control, that is the critical time to protect the cotton plant. Aphids, small, soft bodied insects, uh, some people call them plant lice. We mainly have the cotton aphid. It comes in several forms. We have a winged adult. We have a wingless adult. We have a dark green individual and a yellow individual, all the same same species. Uh, the colonies are usually on the bottoms of the leaves, uh, stems, leaf petioles. They're sucking juice. You will see some little white material in there. Those are the cast skins where the aphids molted and left the skins behind. When I went to work, about all we ever saw was cotton aphid on seedling cotton. Usually it was in cool springs. Uh, the aphids reproduced fine, but the uh, uh, beneficial insects did not. Aphids have a tremendous number of beneficials that, that attack them. They're slow moving, good to eat, uh, and, and occur in large numbers. Uh, aphids do not have males. They're all females. They do not have an egg stage as most uh, other insects do. Uh, each female can reduce uh, produce about 85 young. The life cycle is about five to six days. Put a pencil to that, it's staggering how quickly aphids can, can reproduce and cause a problem if you kill off all the, all the beneficial insects. But the leaves are kind of cut down here with an aphid infestation. Uh, the tops are, uh, of the plant are chlorotic or yellowish. Uh, those leaves kind of cut down and surround the uh, aphid colony beneath. Uh, which is backwards from the thrips. I didn't say it, but those leaves usually cup upwards uh, with, with thrip, thrip seedling. We've just gone through a little bit, bit of this following all the, the thrips applications up here. We flared a few aphids in some fields, but looks like I, I was gone last week, but talking to people yesterday and what I saw, it looks like the beneficials have kind of taken hold and are, are at least at present holding, holding aphids, aphids back. In the mid-1980s, here in North Alabama, uh, we got into mid-season aphids, just horrendous numbers. Uh, we went through the insecticides that provided pretty good suppression real quickly. 
uh, and within a year, year and a half, two years, we could not control the cotton acre at all. It took me two years to convince my counterparts in other parts of the country, and actually I didn't convince them. They, the, the problem finally spread, and they realized that we were looking, looking at resistance. Think about what I said about, uh, about the life history. All females, uh, just you know, incredible numbers. Uh, they're genetic clones out there, so if we come in and kill 99.999% of the population and leave a few uh, resistant individuals, you're, you're in trouble, and you're in trouble quick, quickly. So we, we got where we could not control uh, cotton aphids at all. We, we were seeing them at a time of season, season where we'd never seen them before. Uh, basically, my, my sermon there for years was telling farmers, you know, not spray for thrips when you don't need to, and, and the, these sorts of things. You know, do not put out automatic applications. You know, be, be very careful. Uh, and sometimes I was misread. Barry never said don't spray. I mean, if you've got a problem, you need to take care of it. Uh, but we do need to be careful and, and, and basically scout cotton and, and use thresholds. Uh, insects or insect damage uh, as guidelines to spray. It doesn't have to be Auburn's threshold, can be yours, uh, Genesee's, or, or, or whatever you want to use, but have a reason to go out there than, other than an automatic application and you know that it might help. They don't on the bottom of the leaves, they, they uh, take in just copious amounts of, of, of plant fluids, uh, they excrete those out as a sugary solution, they fall down, cover the leaves. Uh, just real sticky sort of substance. It's just a mess to scout cotton in that thing. And also the number, the aphids themselves, it's tough to be looking for eggs and worms like we, like we used to be. Uh, every time you get honeydew, uh, we call this on the leaves, uh, a, fungal, a fungus will come in and grow on that substrate. It's called sooty mold. Same thing gets on your car, parked under a pecan tree. Uh, different, different aphids, but, but uh, it, it's honeydew and sooty mold. Late season, uh, if you get honeydew on the, on the open bowls, on the lint, the sooty mold will grow there. We cannot gin that out. We cannot bleach it out. You know, the farmer gets less, less for his crop. Uh, when we first started with this problem in the 80s, we said, oh, no, we're in trouble. Uh, we didn't see this. That was taken over at Rogersville. Occasionally, we would see it, but uh, uh, didn't see it. The reason is there's a natural fungus that comes in in July and wipes the cotton aphid out uh, every year. It's a little bit different from year to year, but generally speaking, we're going to knock, knock the aphids out sometime around mid-July. Mid we're starting to see a little bit of rebound that causes me some concern in August, but the aphids will be coming back a little bit. You'll see some speckling of honeydew, but usually the fungus kicks, kicks back in. I went through those years we couldn't control and forgot to add it. <coughs> in 1992, we got the first of the neonicotinoids, uh, imidacloprid. Uh, was called Provado at that time, it's called Trimax now, and it provided wonderful, wonderful aphid control. Uh, we've abused those products, spewing them out everywhere so much that we're starting to see resistance now uh, in those compounds, and I cannot guarantee you uh, control with, uh, with Trimax or its, its sister compounds now. Uh, FMC has a neonicotinoid-like uh, compound that uh, still controls uh, uh, the resistant aphids, so we still can can get control, but we need to be, be very careful. Just a comment about, about the scouting, uh, you know, eggs and worms will live just fine in those, those aphid colonies, they coexist very well. Spider mites, we have the two-spotted spider mite in cotton. And legs, it's got eight, insects have six. This is not an insect. Uh, Couple of reasons I mentioned that. Uh, our normal insecticides don't do a good job in controlling spider mites. It takes specialty products, a caricide or, or, or special insecticides, uh, and usually you're, you're spending a little bit of extra money to control mites and you're not killing much else in, in the way of insects out in, out in the field. The other reason I mention it is they don't have wings. They don't fly. Uh, used to, that was very, very important when we plowed all the ground. Mites had to slowly creep in from the edges of the fields. We never saw early season problems with spider mites uh, back, back early in my career. Now that we've gone to all sorts of minimum till and whatnot, especially where you minimum till into fallowed fields, have a lot of winter weeds out there, they host the spider mites. We come in and herbicide down, burn down the weeds, uh, plant the cotton, it comes up, mites just move over to the, to the cotton. They're already spread, dispersed all over the field, whereas used to, that took a couple of months for that, that to happen. 
They're on the bottoms of leaves, sucking in, uh, sucking juice just like the rest of these things, accentuating drought stress and whatnot. Uh, there's an adult, a couple of immature stages, and a round, clear egg stage down there. Again, you'll see some cast in. If you're using magnification, there's some, some fine webbing down there. They do produce a little silt, but not a whole lot. My counterparts talk about mites ballooning. They can spin a little strand of, of silk and, and, and blow in the air, and they think that's a big thing with dispersal and whatnot. I don't think so. Uh, again, we started with this problem before everybody else had it like, like the aphids here in North Alabama. So we had four or five years uh, of experience, uh, control and lack thereof, uh, before the rest of the belt got into this. But it, it is a, the problem has spread and it's a, a significant issue over much of the belt. But we don't run around looking for uh, mites as a scout. We look for the modeling on the tops of the leaves, the mites are on the bottom feeding, but you'll see some light stippling or modeling on the tops of the leaves. Uh, especially there uh, where it kind of pucker, puckers up. Uh, if you let them go, they'll get worse and worse. Finally, you'll start seeing some red pigment, and you can get in, even get into defoliation if you let them get, get bad enough. So say we're starting to see them on, on seedling cotton. This is in a uh, cover crop. Cover crops do help. If you don't have those winter weeds hosting the mites, it helps a little bit. So if you've got a cereal cover out there, it's going to help you on, on mite control uh, a little bit. And excuse me, but as, as an aside, let me go back to thrips. Uh, the minimum till is going to have uh, a good good deal less thrips pressure in it uh, than will conventionally plowed cotton. The heavier the cover, the less the thrips. Just something I wanted to mention and forgot. But we get mites on this, they're tough to control. We're, we're getting the plant growing, you get growth dilution there. You get new foliage, untreated foliage, uh, coming coming out of the plant. Some of the products we use are, are foliarly systemic, but they don't move up and down the plant. They'll go into that leaf you sprayed them on, but they won't get into the get into the new growth. So you get new growth there. The mite, some of the mites simply move up. Uh, their reproductive potential is close to aphids. I mean, it's just incredible uh, how quickly they turn over, and you're you're right back into a problem within two, two or two and a half weeks, something like that. I cannot guarantee anybody. Uh, season-long mite control with one application before about the middle of July. But when that plant kind of grow, you know, quits growing up, putting on new growth uh, somewhere around mid-July, usually we can come in with a good uh, good product and, and get you to the end of the year. Uh, like the agents, when we couldn't control them, the best thing you can do is, is leave them alone. Don't aggravate them. Uh, these are what we call induced pests. You know, the more you treat, the more prone you are to have aphids, mites, and, and a lot of these sucking in in the field there where they got started in foliage, that was on Green Dry Road here. The, mite, the mites are tough. Uh, they, they really are tough and, and they'll cost 10 or 12 bucks to, to kind of kind of thin, thin them down. Uh, uh, again, the best thing to do is, is try to stay, stay out of trouble. We're already seeing a few mites. Uh, we kind of watch them. Yes, they do like hot, dry weather but that has been way overplayed. Uh, they, they get a foothold, they can do well in some, in some wet weather too. White flies, uh, not such a big problem. They used to be, the pyrethroids came out, gave us pretty good control. Uh, we have the banded wing white fly up here, got a couple of zigzag bands across the uh, wings. They're moth-like creatures. Again, very, very small. You do not see these early seasons. They'll usually be late July, first week of August. They'll come in, get underneath the bottoms of leaves, uh, pair up, mate, start laying eggs. Uh, the eggs hatch into a crawler stage. It will move around, find a feeding site, and put its mouth parts in, and it never moves again until it pupates and comes out as an adult. Uh, as a result, we can't control those. We kill the adults. With most products, we kill the adults in the crawler stage. So it takes a series of applications to, to get decent control. But as I say, I don't know of a spider mate, spider, uh, white fly application up here in several, several years. These will tend to be a little bit worse uh, back in the late 80s and, and on into the 90s. I thought they were kind of coming back due to some resistance issues and whatnot. It, it, it fizzled out and we never saw anything. But you would get quite scared to get out of the truck with the farmer and just look right on the ends of the road. But if you walked on out in the field, you wouldn't, wouldn't see near near. Plant bugs and I'll quit. Uh, tarnished plant bug is the main one we're talking about. There are others. 
Uh, we're up to a third of an inch or something like this. Pretty big insect, very active, move, moves around, long antennae. Go through a couple of generations in the spring. Uh, plant bugs have a lot of different host species that they attack. They like things in the bud stage. Usually they'll produce a generation, which is about a month, 28 days or so, it's pretty long, uh, you know, on, on a particular host, and then they will move, move to another host. Uh, we had a student at Auburn in the, in the late 70s that did a wonderful piece of work right here in North, North Alabama, and he worked out what plant bugs do here. I'm not talking about what plant bugs do in other regions of the country, but what they do in North Alabama. That second generation, they come off a of daisy flea vein, and they're looking for a new host. There isn't one. And that includes cotton. Cotton is a very poor host for tarnished plant bugs. Uh, they'll feed on it and reproduce on it, but they don't particularly like it. And if you'll think about that, it, that explains what's going on with their behavior out there. They're moving into cotton right now. They're just, just starting. Um, we're starting to see some damage on our older cotton now. They'll feed on it, they'll lay eggs on it, they'll reproduce on it, but they're still looking for something better. So they're sort of constantly on, on the move. They come in, lay their eggs in, in pinhead square cotton. They won't move to it until it does begin squaring, uh, you know, which is the bud stage. Uh, this is an egg. It's, it's down halfway into the plant tissue. You'd have to take plants into the lab, look under a microscope to see this. Uh, the egg stage is pretty long, six or seven days, which is quite a bit longer than, than most insects. It'll hatch into a little green nymph. Uh, they suck, suck on the same parts of the plants as the adults, although the little bitty nymphs do a whole lot less damage than the adults. The adults and the larger nymphs uh, do most of the damage. So, so we've got adult plant bugs moving into the field right now. Uh, they can do a lot of damage on their own, and that's what we're going to be looking at for the next 10 days or two weeks. It's going to be a while for that seven-day egg stage to hatch into a little nymph and, and to get enough of those out there and some of some size to really have a nymphal problem. Usually that's very late June uh, on into July that we see that. So primarily we're dealing with uh, uh, an, uh, an adult problem now for the next two weeks. Uh, the adults present a problem. Uh, Sweet net has become real common. We tested all of that in the 1970s. Not a very good sampling method. I like the drop cloth better. It's great on nymphs. Uh, it's not very good on, on adults. Uh, there is no good method uh, for sampling adult plant bugs to quantify them in the field. Uh, it kind of, they kind of change as the day goes by, you know, the temperature or differential between the morning and midday and, and that sort of thing. So, so that presents a problem. But we've got that problem solved. Here's a nymph. Got a little wing patch in the last last stage. He'll be an adult after one more molt. The way we solve that problem is to look at the damage, same as we did with the bow weevil. We didn't go around counting bow weevils. We pulled squares and look look for the damage. Came up with a percent and knew knew when to treat. Same thing with plant bugs in the pinhead square stage. Now I'm going to get to July here in a minute, and it's a little bit different. Uh, the plant bug, be it adult or nymph, they. they the first thing they like on, on young cotton is the pinhead square. That's where they're going to feed, uh, going to go first and feed. Insert their mouth parts, inject saliva because they can't suck up solid tissue, so they dissolve that tissue inside the square and then suck it back up, leaving the square a little bit hollow. It'll turn pale, pale green the first day, a little yellow the next, a little more yellow the next, tan the next, light brown the next, dark brown the next. It'll stay on that plant four or five or six days before it weather, weathers off. So it's there a good while. I like to check right here beneath the main terminal, go down one limb, come out here, and check, check right in there. Now there's a damage square. You see damage in other places, but that sort of help, helps me on my sampling metal and tends to work most of the time. But there again, terminal down, and right here is a little damaged pinhead square. You know, not the bigger square. Pinhead square uh, is the size of a BB, uh, and that's including the bracts surrounding the floral bud. Two types of damage here. There's a little uh, brown pinhead square. Here's a scar where a square has already shed. That's probably plant bugs, but you don't know that. Uh, a lot of people in parts of the world spend a great amount of time going around in cotton fields, fruit mapping, and, and this, that, and the other. And I guess you can learn some things, but as far as plant bugs are concerned, if that's plant bug damage, it's history. I don't care. I want to know what's going on today and make a decision. So I'm looking at pinhead square. 
There's a dark one. It's probably been on that, you know, been damaged for five, five days or more. For some reason, I've had trouble teaching scouts and, and, and whatnot how to do that sample, uh, but it's easy. It's just, you know, you look down, it's good or bad, uh, and that's it. And then you move on to the next plant. You know, just go down to that land, check. You know, there'll always be a square there in, in Pinhead Square Cotton if it's old enough. And, you know, we're borderline on some fields right now. Uh, but but it, it's a real easy sample. If, you, if you're struggling over it, uh, you're, you're doing something, something wrong. There is a little square, usually a little bigger than a pinhead, that the bract will grow into the bud itself, and those things will, they get soft rot bacteria in there and they naturally shed. This is a physiological thing, not caused by anything, but farmers are bad to pick them up on the, uh, you know, down, down by the plant and whatnot. But just ignore that. Usually, I don't know if it's because we're concentrating on plant bugs or not, but usually we see more of that in June than we do later, later in the year, but it, it's usually inconsequential. Plant bugs do another thing in June. This is the worst thing that plant bugs uh, do. Uh, fortunately, it's pretty rare. Uh, I'm talking about crazy cotton. Let's say you've got cotton at nine or 10 nodes, something like that, three or four squares per plant. You get a, a, a heavy inundation of, of adult plant bugs moving into the field. They begin feeding, knocking squares off, and they get you know, most, most of the squares uh, off and have trouble finding more squares to feed on. Uh, they'll move to the bud of the plant. That's the next best feeding site and they'll feed right there in the bud uh, and you remember they're injecting that saliva. Within that saliva is, is uh, some toxins and when it's put into the growing point of that plant, cotton does not like that and it does, does not take it well. It, it's different than going around, you know, like a deer pinching the bud out of a plant. Uh, a lot of entomologists used to simulate that damage. You can't simulate it unless you add the toxin to it. Uh, that, that plant will not turn around and begin squaring for some time. You know, there's one square, but that, that's about it. You know, I've had farmers that go out in late, late June, check the crop, see how it's blooming and whatnot. Not only is it not blooming, there are no squares on it. You know, they're three or four, they've lost three or four weeks of fruiting and didn't, didn't know it. Well, you get whole fields like this uh, where, where the bud, bud is not there. That's 92 or three, I can't remember which year it was, but from the Tennessee line to the Florida line, we had more <coughs> plant bugs than south and central Alabama, uh, but but it was statewide that year. I think we estimated a 350 pound uh, lint loss uh, per, per year. That's what you wind up with. That's 19, late 1960s, so it's, it's not a new problem. Uh, usually that's going to be wet, cool years uh, where you get a lot of reproduction in the spring and in June. We killed the weevil. We got BT cotton. We quit spraying. Uh, to scout school, I used to tell scouts to, you know, about July the 4th or something, forget about plant bug, you know, you know go start concentrating on weevils and worms and, and, and that sort of thing. And that was true then. We were getting incidental control of plant bugs by spraying for other pests, and we didn't see any problems later in the year. Uh, that changed when we quit, quit spraying. So now we're seeing problems in June and even in, I mean, in July and even in August. We're dealing mostly with nymphs. Uh, you know, 90 plus percent of the population are nymphal plant bugs. Uh, they might still like being in squares, I don't know, but it's a whole lot hotter. Uh, plant bugs can't stand a whole lot of heat, so they'll move down into the canopy of the plant, and it seems like what they like most are about two-thirds grown squares. They'll get in that bracket, and they'll hang around in there for quite a while. They're reaching in, feeding on the developing flower part. Uh, the yellow stain there is where the plant bug defecated on the, on the square while feeding. May or may not. You can't. You can't depend on that. I'd say most of the most of the time not. Square looks perfectly normal until it blooms, and then you see what damage the plant bug did. He reached in through the, you know, the rolled up petals at that time, feeding on those flower parts. We call those dirty blooms. Uh, we didn't have sampling methods, thresholds, or anything when we when this problem cropped up in the late 90s, and we spent a lot of times trying to trying to sort this thing out and didn't come up with any great solution. I worked very hard on, on trying to quantify dirty blooms to have scouts and consultants do some quick quick samples. A drop cloth works pretty well, but who is it time consuming at that time of year? You get bloom tags, all sorts of things on the cloth. Uh, it, it's an ugly, ugly sample. I just never could quantify it. Dirty blooms still tell me a whole lot. I can walk around your cotton field with my hands in my pockets 
the nymphs like to get in blooms. I'll see you know enough nymphs that I know there are some in the system. Um, and then now, if these are fairly common, then you know I know I know I'm getting some damage in those fields. Uh, we did a lot of talking about that because of some of these sampling problems, and maybe we talked too much. Uh, plant bugs aren't going to tote off the crop in July. You, you can wait a week or, or whatever. Yes, they do some damage, and yes, we need to control them sometimes, and you don't let, need to let them go too far, uh, but, but they are not near as damaging as, as, as those adult plant bugs on pin edge square crop. This was field down the road. I was looking some hail damage walked across the road, and, and every, every square in that field had been damaged. I pinched the ends off after seeing all the dirty blooms, and it was 100% damage. We don't generally go around pinching the ends off squares, but you you could do that. Here's plant bug damage of two sorts. Uh, plant bugs will feed on developing bowls, usually young soft soft bowls. Here they're they're feeding on the developing seeds, the soft soft seeds on the inside. The black spots are where a plant bug penetrated uh, with their proboscis, uh, sucked some juices from those those developing seeds. Uh, the right hand side, the two locks on the right hand side are not filled out, you know, maybe three or four seeds in, instead of eight or nine, something like that. That's plant bug damage to the squares. It resulted in the dirty bloom. The blooms didn't pollinate very well, and, and so you got a misshapen bowl. That's 1978 up here. You can, you, this bowl is too big, but you, you can go into bowls and, and you know, look, look for this stain. Ron's going to cover this more in depth, so I won't do much uh, on stink bugs. But that's really the best way to sample for plant bugs or stink bugs uh, in July and August is to do a bowl damage survey uh, and come up with a, a threshold there. It's bowl damage, you know, it, it varies. Uh, you know, from very severe to you know maybe just one lock partially, uh, partially done. But if you miss, if you miss uh, in season July or August plant bugs or stink bugs, boy does it show up off the cotton picker. The farmer will see that and uh, not not be very happy. Adult big nymphs do most of the damage. This is a cotton flea hopper we see from time to time. A lot smaller, pale pale green with some black flecking on it. Same sort of damage, but he's so small he doesn't do any bowl damage. Uh, and really the pin edge square damage isn't, isn't doing much. And if we're going by fruit damage, who cares? Uh, the same chemicals control him. So, same with this insect, the clouded plant bug. We see those commonly from time to time, usually in July, uh, they move into cotton. But I've never seen a problem with either of those insects that the tarnished plant bug wasn't the overwhelming uh, majority of the insects doing the damage out in, in the field. Questions? All right, Eric. Eric. Yes. What would be wrong with a cotton farmer saying, okay, on such and such date, I'm going to spray for. Uh, Thrips, a couple of applications, and later on he looks at his calendar and says, "Okay, I'm gonna spray for plant bugs." And next, he's gonna spray for uh, something else. What's wrong with that kind of strategy? Too much variation. I mean, you don't know when they're going to occur or if they're going to occur. It's, you know, these insects being a reason, mites and aphids, you know, flaring, flaring other other things. Uh, George, I think in some high risk fields, are recommending a, an automatic foliar application for thrips at the one true leaf stage. And that's not every acre, uh, but some of these high risk, early planted, April cotton, uh, uh, non-minimum till, you know, uh, conventionally cultivated and that sort of thing, that, that, that their, their data says you're going to have a problem, you know, 80, 90% of the time or more. Uh, so it's probably behooves you to spray. I got the same data, uh, worked with Valent for many years, put out orthene as an automatic one true leaf uh, application for thrips control did that you know had had at planting products underneath but then added that one thing I got a yield bump every year uh, I hadn't gone as far as to make that an automatic application but the other ones you know just too unpredictable uh, uh, plant bugs are too unpredictable I know farmers that have, that have done automatics for, for plant bugs and 
Generally, you, you get in trouble. I've known farmers that make two June applications for plant bugs and missed them. You know, they got damage, you know, plus they killed the benefit, you know, did all the bad things that, that applications do, and still missed uh, the, brunt, uh, the brunt of the migration. Uh, it can happen in a hurry. But that's why we scout, scout, scout. Right? All right, well, let me explain how we split this up. A number of years ago, Barry, when Barry and I were covering it by ourselves, we uh, split up the spectrum kind of, and we, uh, we, we went with the, uh, the person that had the most experience with the different pests. Of course, Barry had more experience with plant bugs and sucking pests up here. I had more experience being in, in Auburn and Central and South Alabama. I had more experience with the boll weevil, all the caterpillar pests that feed on cotton, boll worms, tobacco bud worms, and and uh, a little bit on stink bugs back then. But uh, what's happened, they've almost, uh, technology and bow weevil eradication has almost phased me out of the, uh, the scouting program. So I don't have much left, but uh, in both of our other scouting schools, and we've conducted, uh, we've conducted two last week, uh, one here in central Alabama, one down in southeast Alabama, and surprisingly, there was at least one person in both crowds that was still dealing with conventional cotton. So before I uh, move through the caterpillar pest real fast, can I see, is there anybody here that's got any involvement with conventional cotton still? That'll determine how fast or slow maybe I move or make a few points. So I didn't see any hands, so it's, a, it's something we feel like we really need to cover just so you would be able to recognize some of these different species of, of uh, caterpillar pests. But uh, since we've gone to the two gene cotton as opposed to the single gene that we first in, was first introduced at Bogard, we, uh, we really have so few caterpillar pests now that they're just almost academic. <clears throat> a couple of other comments. Uh, this is a poster that I made way back in the 1980s, and you'll see uh, bow weevils on here, but you won't see uh, you won't see stink bugs. But I still use it, and I use it to make one point, uh, and that is these yellow bars represent when that particular pest might be at damaging levels. And if you'll notice, there are different windows to some degree for different pests. So my point in in saying that is to say that you don't have to look for all 15 pests every minute you're in the field. Normally there's two or three that you're wanting to key in on at that particular time of the year. So that's the only, only a purpose in that. And uh, these charts have got an interest, interesting history to them. I think I told the group last year, but uh, they were made in New York. I happened to be doing a little business up there at that time, and they sent them out for me. I designed them, they sent them out, the same people if some of you are old enough to know, the Iranian Contra hearings that were going on back in the 1980s, uh, 85 or so, the same people who were making the Iranian Contra charts for the stuff in Washington were, made my charts for me, so this chart's got a pretty interesting history to it. But anyway, we'll go through the caterpillar pest now, and I use this slide to point out, you know, there's two really that we've always contended with, the corn earworm or the bowl worm, that's one species. Then you've got the tobacco budworm. And the point I'm making with this slide, even though these two caterpillars are different colors, we can't go by the color to separate the corn earworm or the bowl worm from the tobacco budworm. You can go a little bit by the time of the year, early on, but then by the time you get to August, they blend it together, so you likely got a mix of the two. But we can, let me focus this just slightly. Not quite as sharp as it could be. But as you're walking through the field, you can uh, detect the difference, which species it is by the, the uh, moth that uh, you might kick up or jump up out in front of you if you'll keep your eye open as you're walking. On the left is the bow worm species. You can see it's a buff colored tan with uh, some black markings, the black dot here, and some black markings back here, a little bit larger moth. On the right is the tobacco budworm, uh, got some bands to the wings, a smaller moth. Uh, these moths are normally more of a yellowish green color, and they're more skittish, so they're gonna get up farther away from you out in the field. 
But that's, uh, in the old days, that was a pretty good clue as to what you were dealing with. These moths are depositing eggs. A lot of them are deposited right after daylight or around that time in the morning. They're pearly white to begin with, about the size of a, uh, a good pencil dot uh, or dull pencil. And they take on a little bit more of a tinge color on day two and three in the hatch after about three days. And you can begin to say the little larvae is uh, hatching or uh, developing inside. That makes them take a little bit more of a brownish color. And lots of times after the caterpillar come out, the hull may be there uh, or they'll get grayish toward the end. We always uh, start looking for bollworms, budworms in the terminal of the plant and particularly in June and July. And uh, this would be what we'd want to do if we wanted to, if we were concentrating on these things, because now, as I say, we don't do a lot of that. But uh, if, the, uh, if the moth has deposited the egg near the terminal, and they, they tend to want to deposit the egg where the tenderest, freshest part of the plant is. And early on in June and early July, it will be in the terminal of the plant because that's a rapid growing part of the plant. You can see what the uh, egg looked like here on the new unfolding leaf. Normally you see a one single egg lay, but here we've got two on that one. It was on one of the younger leaves near the top. There are some other eggs out there, and some are round or similar in shape to the uh, bollworm or budworm. Uh, those are cut worms or loopers or some things like that. But one of the beneficials is also out there, and that's a little long uh, slender egg. That's the big-eyed bug egg. And we'll see those along in early season as the big-eyed bugs are, are colonizing in cotton. And they are already doing that now, by the way. Now, back to the worms. Uh, if the egg's deposited in the terminal, that's where the little caterpillar is going to feed first. So it's going to leave a plant looking something similar to this where you can see the discoloration there where they've uh, done a little feeding. You can dig around in there with your fingernails and last time pull out the little one day old or less aged larvae. Now here's one where they've come down just slightly one node below there and began feeding in the fruit. And you can see a size of the caterpillar is going to be represented by the, uh, the head capsule is going to be represented by the hole in the little square. Uh, after about five days, they can move down the plant into a little bit larger square. It looks something like that. Now, later on in the season, as cotton begins to slow down its vegetative growth, the moth knows to deposit eggs at other places on the plant because that will become a more tender part. And in July and early August, they will deposit on square blacks, even stems sometimes, but square blacks and bloom tags, white and red blooms. This would be one that's uh, deposited on a square bracket. When that happens, the little caterpillar doesn't move very far. They're more difficult to find on the plant. What he does, he slides right in between those bracts and goes in there and starts nibbling on the little square. So he may stay there for several days. Uh, if it's on a brown uh, bloom tag or a white, uh, or white bloom tag, they will go inside and hide under that bloom tag. And so that's the reason if you're kind of interested in what's happening with bollworms, breaking off or looking in white blooms, breaking off uh, brown blooms, uh, red or brown blooms as you're walking through the field and looking underneath them is a real good way to assess if there's any problem with a, a bollworm situation. Another one here uh, on a bloom that's changing color. Uh, you can see what happens when they get under that bloom. They stay right there, they can feed on the bloom a little bit, enough to get started, and then they go right in the tip of that little bowl. And you see this caterpillar is eight to 10 days old. He hasn't been anywhere else on the plant except that one site. So back when we really had to concentrate on caterpillars, on worms, we, uh, we at some point about mid-season, we would quit looking at so many terminals and spend more time looking on individual plants because you had to open some of these blooms, you had to open some of the squares in order to find those little caterpillars that were completely hidden and not moving on the plant. 
All right, eventually they, uh, after about 14 days, they become large caterpillars, and eventually if there's bowls on the plant, work their way down to the bowls, and that's where they do uh, even more damage. All right, that's all I'm gonna say on bollworms, budworms, so we'll move right through. There's so a few other caterpillar pests that we should mention. Most of them, we haven't had any problem with these others, and particularly since we've gone to the 2-gene cotton, it's just about zeroed them out too. This is the fall army worm. If you'll notice, there's an inverted Y on the head capsule right here, and they're more of a pinkish brown color most of the time. But there's some color variations in the fall army worm also. You see this one's a little more brown. I'll show you the inverted Y here. And while we're talking about fall army worms, let me mention that we've had fall army worms all over the state the last two or three years on hay crops, pastures, lawns, athletic fields, uh, hunting deer plots in the fall, and everything else. That is a different army worm. It's a different strain of the army worm. That army worm is feeding on all our grasses and hay and everything. It's called the grass strain, or in the Mid-South they call it the rice strain, R-I-C-E. Uh, but they do not like cotton. So. This uh, grass strain will feed heavily on soybeans. They'll feed heavily on peanut foliage, uh, but they just don't like cotton. So just because you hear of a lot of army worms doesn't mean we're gonna have a year uh, of a lot of pressure on cotton. Uh, there is, a, here's a more green phase of this fall army worm and on the fourth segment behind the head, you may not can see it, but right under the laser light, is a black dot, and it's normally in a darker band along the caterpillar. So that's another uh, identifying marker for the fall army worm. Fall army worms, eggs not, do not come from individual eggs, but uh, from an egg mass. They're normally deposited underneath the bottom of the leaves, and the army worm on cotton has a high degree of mortality. Normally you only get one or two survivors out of an egg mass. That's different than the one I'm gonna show you here is coming up in just a second. Uh, the fall army worm, uh, when they occur, they love blooms also, and they'll get in white blooms and, and love to feed there, and they will also feed on bowls. And here's one that's uh, spent a, a lot of its life in this bloom and still uh, feeding there on the little bowl, rolled up in a, a bloom tag. Okay, if I was if I were in the position of monitoring cotton and I heard people talking, army worms come normally from the south to the north because they overwinter better in the south. It's a semi-tropical type pest. I wouldn't spend much time looking for army worms unless I heard through media reports that there are army worms on cotton. If, if I heard that, then I, this is what I would start looking for. Normally we'll be in August. There will be bowls out there. I would look around the bracts of the bowls low on the plant. You'll see etching similar to this on the outside. And what you do, you just, you just fold the back bract back away from the bowl and you'll see where likely a fall lineman worm has been etching here. You can see the manure. The little caterpillar would be very green at that point because what he's eating is very green. Uh, later on, he'll start taking on a little bit more of the army worm color when he gets a little size on. But they will stay that at that point a long time also. Now, here's another army worm, a different one. A beet army worm, B-E-E-T. Uh, they are a species that's normally associated with dry weather, real dry uh, periods and the only time we've ever had major problems with this insect in Alabama has either been in real real dry years of the past or uh, during the eradication uh, phase because what was happening there's a little Cortesia wasp that's a terrific parasite on the beet army worm. Normally if you're spraying a field here and a spray a field there these little Cortesia wasps have a refuge, so they come back and resupply a field pretty quick. But in order to accomplish eradication, we had to spray a lot of fields in an area over a two or three day period. We wiped all the Cortesia out in the county or, the, or that region of the state, and that's the reason we had 
severe outbreaks of the beet army worm during that period. Uh, we really haven't had much. Occasionally we can find a little bit of a sign of them in a hot, dry period, and I'll show you where to look uh, here in just a second. But uh, I don't expect the beet army worm to ever be a significant pest of cotton again in Alabama. They also come out of an egg mass deposited underneath the leaf. But whereas the fall armyworm has a high mortality and a very few survive, the beet armyworm all survive. And they feed a long time around that egg mass underneath the leaf. And then they eventually scatter. But what happens when they feed on in that egg mass, they eat the bottom surface off the leaf and it makes the leaf turn brown on top and it leaves a little spot like this. So you can spot that a distance away and normally you'll find that on the most stunted, stressed cotton in the field. Lots of times there might be one plant sitting out at the edge of a field that didn't get uh, enough fertilizer or something. That's the one that uh, beet army one will lay on first. So uh, skippy cotton or stunted plants is what uh, uh, beet army worms are attracted to, drought stressed plants. Okay, here they are. Uh, still in a clump but beginning to move out eat more foliage and uh and eventually they also go and eat up white blooms and will also eat up bowls now here's an army worm uh comes from a single egg again the one that's far to my knowledge has really never been a pest but i kind of put it in there because it might be possible you could run into one someday this is a yellow striped army worm it's a bigger bodied fat worm uh, black with a uh, yellow stripe. It's got a, a big dark area right here, about three or four segments behind the head. Uh, but again, the uh, yellow striped army worm has never been a, a pest of cotton. Just occasionally used to see one. Now, there's another army worm that uh, in the last decade has been a problem particularly in the lower coastal plains of the southeast, and that would be the Florida Panhandle, South Georgia. I'm sure, Eddie, uh, y'all had them over there, and we had them down in the southern tier of counties, and that's the southern army worm. And uh, they actually would uh, come through uh, some on a single gene cotton, and the way they did that, they love morning glories. If there's any morning glories in the field, they would deposit the moths and deposit the eggs on the morning glories. They'll clean up the morning glories, then they're half grown or big or they're more and they can move over to cotton they don't get enough they didn't get enough bt gene to kill them but we've actually had to spray for these they're easy to kill not like some of the others easy to kill but once we went to the two gene cotton the stack genes uh insect genes that is uh with then this 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 uh species is out of the out of the window also <clears throat> They look a little bit like the yellow stripe, except you'll see a lot of them. And they're terrific foliage feeders. A few will go to blooms and bowls, but the majority of these will continue to eat on foliage. <clears throat> and the only other caterpillar, I believe this is the last one, is uh, you can get loopers on cotton. Normally it's late season. And when you do, it's not cabbage loopers, it's soybean loopers most of the time. And they are much harder to kill than, uh, than cabbage loopers are. And of course, we had a, a flush of these statewide on soybeans last year, and I'm sure Dr. Reed will mention those again. Uh, they're a, a green worm, uh, loop when they crawl, uh, white stripe, and uh, I don't think we'll see many of those coming through our two gene cotton. So really, we don't have much to worry about on the caterpillars on cotton anymore. Uh, this is a, a particular pose that a looper likes when you knock them off. In particular, if you're knocking them off a soybean plant, maybe uh, onto a drop cloth, they will want to stand up on their back end. Okay. <clears throat> now, we're moving on to the last pest that I want to talk about, but uh, I realize it's, it's not a pest that's been a major problem in this part of the state. You know, I was going to say earlier, really, uh, the state is quite different uh, biologically. Uh, the Tennessee Valley being a lot similar to the Mid-South in a lot of ways biologically. Now we have a whole different philosophy over here than they do over there, but uh, in a lot of ways there's some similarities, particularly with sucking pests. Uh, 
But in the southern part of the state, uh, in which, which I would refer to as the coastal plains, and that encompasses uh, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, this is the dominant cotton insect now, the stink bug, by far. Thrips are down there as an economic pest, but the stink bug is a major player. We've had lawsuits over 50% where the farmer was suing for 50% yield loss due to this pest. That was really back before we got really accustomed to what they were doing to us. So, tremendous potential, if, if you don't know. And, and let me say this before I get into the stink bug itself. I realize that there haven't been a major factor up here, but corn is a stink bug building reservoir in the spring. You've got a lot of corn. You know, they're, they're on wheat early, and then they come off and they do a lot of reproducing on corn, and they do a lot of reproducing again in the late summer on soybeans. My point is, if you've got a cotton field, that's close to some corn, you might really want to watch. And particularly on the, the first 50 to 100 feet or so, because stink bugs will, they're not like a plant bug, will just move across the countryside. A stink bug will basically move just as far as it takes to get to another food source. When corn starts drying down, they will all leave corn. And they're looking for something else. If a cotton field's nearby, I would be really alert on the side adjacent to the corn for stink bug damage. And I'm going to show you a little bit about how we scout and what to look for. Uh, there's two or three species, and I don't, I'm not crazy about some of my slides. Never get around to updating them. I've, uh, I've got better ones that I use in the winter grower meetings, but I haven't uh, switched them over to the scouting school. We got the green and the southern green. Normally it's the southern green species, although we did run into some populations of, of green stink bugs last year on soybeans in Alabama, particularly in the central part of the state. This is the immature stage, uh, a later end star. The uh, earlier end stars have got a little blackish orange markings on them. This is the green stink bug now, southern green rather. Uh, and then you got a brown species, and the browns uh, overwinter better. Uh, and particularly you'll find a lot of them in wheat and also are much more difficult to control. Uh, the immature of the green has these, uh, you see where they come out of the egg mass, so they tend to be clumped early on and they've got the little orange and black markings on them. Now, <clears throat> probably don't need to know this up here, but I won't say it real quick. If you've got stink bugs moving to cotton before you've got bowls 10 to 12 days old, and that's about the third week of bloom. That's normally when we really start focusing on stink bugs and cotton. But if you've got stink bugs there before cotton gets to that stage, they will go to younger bowls. Just as soon as the bloom drops off, that's what they'll feed on. Stink bugs do not feed on the plant, per se. They do not feed on squares but they will, or blooms, but they'll feed on a small bowl if that's the best they can do. And when they do, that bowl's gonna abort and come completely off the plant. But that's not classic to what we uh, like to talk about with stink bug injury. This is similar to what Barry showed, and this could be either a, or a plant bug or a stink bug, but this one I like better because this is more classic stink bug where you've got a large sunken indentions, and sometimes you'll actually see multiple of those uh, on, the, on the bowl. And I can tell you this, uh, the more places they feed on the bowl, the greater the odds you're going to get internal injury. Now what we're seeing here is external injury. So we really, we use that a little bit in, in a, uh, going through our sample, but that's not the important thing. It's what happens internal in the bowl that's important. And as the stink bug is feeding, they're introducing bowl rot organisms mechanically through the wall into the bowl, and you get discoloration here. They're actually trying to get to the seed. The protein, seed's a protein source for the stink bug. And uh, so you've got discoloration inside. You've got uh, holes in the, uh, the bowl wall here where they've, they've pierced. You've got uh, 
little callous places like this where the, the bowl has tried to heal itself from stink bug injury, and that normally forms just two or three days at most or less after the injury through the bowl wall. And one other thing we've seen in the coastal plains, uh, in real wet seasons in the fall, you still got a lot of bowls, and this, this bowl may have been made in South Georgia, Eddie, because uh, in those first years it was so wet when we really got into stink bugs, you could see yellow stain lint on that damage. But that's not typical. You don't see that every year in every place. But I think it's associated with wet falls when y'all are still making that late crop like y'all used to it, or still do in South Georgia. Uh, there's another species that does a damage identical to the stink bug. And that's the leaf-footed bug. <clears throat> and we get them along the Gulf Coast of Alabama. They're a real major problem at our research station. Our counterpart to Belmont is at Fairhope, Alabama. You got these things down there from the spring on. You can find them around even up here. If you look in old uh, gardens where people have let their tomatoes cycle out, you'll see leaf-footed bugs up here. Uh, like I say, they love to feed on bowls. They're damaged and identical to stink bugs, so we don't try to separate it. Another color variation in the leaf-footed bug, and you can see where they get their name uh, with a big uh, enlargement there on the back leg. Uh, the immature uh, leaf-footed bug is orangey in color. Stink bug damage can be, as Barry said, uh, this bug damage can be anywhere from one lock to two locks to the entire bowl. Uh, Normally the picker doesn't get those hard locks that never fluff, so you can go anywhere from the normal bowl all the way to where you're getting no yield out of a bowl. So uh, a potentially devastating pest of cotton, uh, but I think most years your winter kill up here probably keeps the uh, southern green stink bug numbers down, and uh, so it takes them a while to rebuild. But let me, uh, okay, Gerald, uh, go ahead. My question is, how do you scout for them? What chemical and how often do you use it? Well, I'm going to get into the scouting part right here. Uh, I guess that, that length, long life cycle is good and bad. Uh, the bad part is, if you've got an adult stink bug in your field in July, it's a good chance that stink bug is going to be there when the cotton is mature. The immature stages, the egg and immature stages, take about 30 days. The adult lives 30 or more days, so the life cycle is 60 something days. That means if you've got a stink bug on July the 28th, he's easy, can be there the 1st of September. Uh, chemicals, uh, the pyrethroids and the phosphates like bidrin, methylparathon, which is only available the rest of this year, uh, probably malathion, orthene, those things do a real good job on the green stink bug, the southern green. On the brown stink bug, it's a little bit more difficult. The bidrin is clearly the most economical choice. Your orthene at three quarters to a pound will give you pretty good suppression, but really you almost need a pound. Uh, if you have to stay with a, a pyrethroid and, uh, and and I don't know if Tim will mention this in another class, but see, we get these on, on soybeans too, and uh, you can't use orthene or bidrin on uh, soybeans, so that means your arsenal is real limited. Of the pyrethroids, uh, all of them do an adequate job on the southern green, but if it's the brown, you just about got to go to the bifenthrin, which is the old capture of one of the generics. It'll give you on up 70-80% uh, control where the average pyrethroid would be 40-60% to 60 control on the brown species. But uh, during break, if you can't see that from where you're at, but we fixed up a banner here a few years ago so I could take this to field days and things like that and put it up, but I've got the brown and the immature brown. And I didn't show you in the slide, but the immature brown is actually green. And then you've got the green, the slides that I showed, 
You've got the leaf-footed bug that we showed. Here's the classic symptoms here, being from the stain lint to the uh, damage, the uh, callus warts, and, uh, and then here. But the main thing I want to use off this, and you may not can see it, but how do you scout a field? Really, we suggest taking a sample of at least 25 bowls, minimum of 25. The larger the field, the more bowls you need to pull to get a representative sample. Uh, you want to pull bowls that are 10 to 12 days old. They've got to be still soft when you reach to pull them. There's not but about one, possibly two on the plant that's the ideal age in a given day that you're in the field. There's one particular bowl on that plant that you're looking for. And it's soft enough you can squeeze it because you're going to crush it with your hand. So you don't want to pull it too hard. So we're going to pull at a minimum of 25 bowls, let's say. All right? We're going to make two piles out of them. We're going to make a pile with those that's got external damage. That's real fast. Put the ones that has no external damage over here. All right, let's say we've got five out of that 25 that had external damage. Those are the ones we're going to break open because that's going to take a few minutes. You can't afford to break all, all of them open. It's too time consuming. You break open those five. And let's just say that three of them had internal damage. If you've exceeded the threshold for that particular week of bloom, and I'll get to that in a second, then you don't crush, you don't open the rest of them. You've already over threshold, you already got a treatment decision you can make. So let's just say three of them were three out of the 25, three out of the five, that's 12%. Uh, uh, and then we come back here and we look where we're at. You've really got to keep up with where you're at in the blooming cycle. To, to utilize this sliding threshold, or dynamic threshold as we call it. And this threshold was documented by research from Auburn, Georgia, South Carolina, Clemson, North Carolina State, and Virginia. They all worked on it as a team project funded by Cotton Incorporated, a very good threshold. They found that if they, on weeks uh, one, two, and particularly the first couple of weeks of bloom, it really didn't pay to spray for stink bugs unless they really were giving you a lot of damage, like 30 to 50 percent. Same way with week seven or eight as cotton is phasing out because there's not much bowls at risk early or late. There are four weeks in the summer that, that uh, in the season that most of the bowls are being produced. And that's weeks three, four, five, and six of bloom. That's the reason it's important to kind of know when your field starts to bloom. Three, four, five, and six, we lower that threshold to 10% internal damage. So see, out of those 25, we had five that had external, three that had internal with 12%. If we're in those four critical weeks, that's a treatment that we're ready to treat. Any questions on, uh, that's hopefully giving you enough. But if you got a quick question on stink bugs, we'll move on uh, and let somebody else be on the program. But uh, that's all I had. Hopefully it's some help to you. Uh, appreciate your attention. All right, Eric, back to you. I'll get right into this. This is a kind of a brief topic that we added a couple of years ago. We talked about sporadic pests of cotton. These are things that may show up uh, hither and thither and yon. It's not a problem unless it's in your field or a field you're checking. So we'll cover this and hopefully uh, you'll know what it is when you see it. The first one we're gonna talk about is vegetable weevil. Vegetable weevil uh, we saw this in Colbert County, I think it was about four years ago. Uh, it was scattered across the field, uh, feeding on seedling cotton plants. Generally, it's a, give you an idea of how big it is. There it is, at the end of that, uh, end, of, end of my blade there. Uh, it feeds on the leaves and the stems of cotton. It can break it off at the, the ground where it's fed on it here, or sometimes you'll see holes eating out of the cotyledons by this insect. Um, pyrethroid will control it. It's generally not a field-wide problem. It, like I said, it, it tends to be clumped around certain species of weeds, um, and it's not going to be a pest once the cotton gets a couple of leaves on it, true leaves. It's going to be past the, the point where it'll hurt it. Um, we also see where we have a lot of residue in our no-till situations now. We're starting to see some slug damage in, at times. 
and snail damage, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. The, uh, the product of, of choice is expensive and some say that if you could figure out a way to band it on, you might be able to use the metaldehyde as the common chemical name. It works, but it's expensive. And this is the kind of damage you'll see. The holes look, remind me of what bean leaf beetles do on soybeans, same, similar uh, types of holes. Uh, this is a slug that we found infesting a soybean field. I don't have any slides of slugs feeding on cotton, but they do similar damage. Here's where they ate, ate out the, a hole in the stem on the soybean plant. When the plant was trying to come up out of the ground, they fed on it here and here. On the cotyledon, as it was coming out of the ground, they fed on it there. Uh, Three-cornered alfalfa hoppers, thank goodness they're not the issue on cotton if they're on soybeans, but they will feed on soybeans, and when they do, the damage is dramatic. That's the adult. That's the immature. We'll talk about it more in more detail on soybeans. But they, they girdle the stem of the cotton plant. They turn it red. And this is what you'll see out in the field. You'll see this stunning cotton plant with the very red leaves on it. It looks a little bit... Reminds me of uh, what we used to see on land aid on cotton, turn it red like that. Or if you've got water stressed cotton, the main stem will be red on real wet water stressed cotton. White fringe, white fringe beetle a duck can sometimes show up uh, in the cotton field, feed on the leaves. Characteristic identification on it is the uh, white margin on the side. This is the, uh, the immature insect. This thing feeds on about 385 different plants, so it can show up uh, on just about any crop. And they'll feed on the roots. The immature stage will eat up the roots. There are some holes where the damage was done. Here's on peanuts where they broke off the root here, and they'll also feed on the small lateral roots. And there he is there in the sand. False chitch bug, this thing gives us fits in a lot of crops. It's kind of hard to control because it likes to get down in the soil. Here it is on cotton where it's gotten up on the plant, sucking it down, it's going to kill it. Burr bug is another insect that can show up on cotton. We've had some reports on it again this year. The adults and immatures will get up on the plant, come up out of the, where they're hiding, and sometimes they get up on the plant and suck it down and kill it. I've seen them wipe out a stand of cotton, whether they wasn't an insecticide seed treatment on the, on the cotton seed, Larry. Just take the, whole, take the whole field out, small fields. And that's the immature stage, very distinct dark red insect on the, on the abdomen. We haven't had as much problem with grasshoppers feeding on cotton and no-till cotton in North Alabama as they have in Central Alabama. But when you have them, they can get, get, in, the, get in the bed with you. They really do, can cause a lot of damage to your cotton field. They're going to overwinter in egg cases that were deposited in the fall, and uh, they're going to be a problem in reduced tillage systems. They can feed on the foliage but uh, the, the most damage is going to happen when they feed on that crook stage and, and eat that cotton plant off at the, at the top where it's starting to come out of the ground. They can graze on the cotyledon stage and, and feed on it as well as feed on the main stem. And they can, uh, as you see here, they nod on the cotyledon right here and ate it off. They can migrate out of the edge of a field off of weeds and move out into the field and take out your stand. Main thing you need to remember is when you spray and you burn down spray on your weeds, if you go out in your field and you pick them up, you want to be sure you add a pyrethroid to it. You may want to do this anyway on, on uh, fields where you have a uh, tendency to have cutworms. A pyrethroid will do a pretty good job on the immature stages, but once they get to be adults, it's tough. It's tough to kill an adult grasshopper on uh, cotton or soybeans. Um, also, some people have had pretty good luck using two ounces of Dimlin with their, uh, in, their, in their spray to take out the immature grasshoppers. They won't kill adults, so make sure you don't have winged ones out there when you put the Dimlin in. Make sure they're immatures. And uh, that's another control option. If you're in a, especially if you're in a sensitive place where you don't like to use 
use chemicals, maybe near a subdivision or where you're worried about some kids getting out in it, but demo is not going to cause you any problems. It's safe to use. Take the, it'll mess your fingernails up because it's a chitin synthesis inhibitor and you get chitin in your fingernails. So, other than that, it's not, it shouldn't cause any grief. Um, garden flea hoppers can also show up in cotton. They were, there were a lot of these the other day at Prattville where Ron was doing some sampling. Um, they will, they have an enlarged hind leg. This segment here is going to be enlarged. Help you to identify it. And they stipple the leaves and sometimes they'll feed on squares. So if you see some, some unusual leaf stippling, you may have flea hopper damage in your cotton. Flea beetle is also uh, an insect, another uh, coleopterous pest that can feed on the cotton plant. And it's going to cause this unusual type of feeding on the cotyledon leaves. It can also feed on the true leaves, but it's going to graze the leaves kind of like a, uh, a bean leaf beetle will graze a leaf on a soybean, a pot on a soybean plant. Another insect that shows up sometimes in the cotton field and seedling cotton and causes problems is salt marsh caterpillars. I've never seen it bad enough to spray for, but I have seen them individually in spots in cotton fields feeding on seedling cotton plants. They'll just chew off the leaves. Here's an egg mass on some older cotton. That's what the egg masses look like. Japanese beetle can show up in your cotton field and you'll see the damage. You may not see where the beetle is, but they tend to aggregate in groups and not be scattered over the field, but they're going to be clumped. And they're going to do this kind of damage. I've never seen them feed on squares or blooms, though. John, I've never seen them feed on anything but the leaves. And hopefully that's all we'll ever see. But I'm not going to say it won't be. Uh, that's the ones I wanted to cover. And I'm going to let, uh, has anybody got any questions before Austin comes up? Talks about cotton diseases. We'll knock cotton out, and then we'll talk about soybeans. Gerald? I started scouting cotton in 1970, 43 years ago, and back then we had so many bow weevils, they didn't count them in the traps, they measured them. Yeah. And uh, it, it's really strange to see the progress that's been made uh, with cotton, insects, and, and that thing. And uh, I, I trapped bow weevils for three summers. And uh, I, I was surprised to find out there's so many weevils out there in the field. I turned one into my supervisor and they said, no, that's not a bow weevil. And yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. And time and time again, I turned in a weevil and they said, no, that's not a bow weevil. Right. But what I'm saying is we've come a long way. It's not some of these insects you're talking about today. It's going to be something else later on. Yeah. Sooner or later, things that aren't real problems now will become a problem at some point in time more than likely if we don't have genetic manipulation to control it. 